listening to my presentation. I also got I'm, I'm drenched today in Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Are you going to say something? Now there's feedback though? Yeah. And share the recording out there. Yeah. Hello, hello. Okay. Working. Okay. So there is feedback. with a capital B. So that's how I identify as a Black American woman. 
I'm also a descendant of an enslaved African living here in the United States, and I'm a descendant of landowners and educators and entrepreneurs. I'm a survivor of child sexual assault. I'm a survivor of domestic violence, and I'm an artist. I'm also an entrepreneur, an educator, and a cosmetologist. And I also live on colonized land of the Ho-Chunk, Ottawa, Miami, and Potawatomi. And the reason why I wanted to know all of these things about me is because all of these things inform my art. They inform the stories that I'm telling when I'm making my art. If this works, we'll be going to the next slide. Um, your friend Larry. I think it's so funny because we had such a time with this whole entire situation. We should be listening more. You know, I think we're trying to this is like it's like the spirits are like, what is happening here? You know, we can't get we can't get we can't get the keys in the room, we can't get the art in the room, we can't get the the internet to go, like today everything shut down, you know. <laughs> this must be a really important story to tell. <laughs> we can't get anything to work. <laughs> okay. And Larry, on his day off, has been thank you very open. So, um, really, everyone, thank you. Oh, my cousins are here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why nothing was working. We were waiting for you guys to come. So, I just want to let you know a little bit about my uh, core artistic beliefs. My work evolves around the human condition as it relates to culture, identity, equity, behavior, belonging, and social norms. And I use photography, video, and other media, like wood that this piece is made from, and fabric and to tell stories unlike the dominant social culture. Africans in the diaspora and marginalized people are my focal points. Exploring and questioning the limited view dominant cultures have of the underrepresented is paramount to my storytelling. These stories are important to me because I believe our shared humanity is better understood when we experience narratives about cultures different from our own. And this is a piece in this picture that I did last uh, year for a public art show in front of Lisa's gathering. And after I took down this piece, I needed a little break from art, and I dove into a book by Tommy C. Coates. And the book is called The Water Dancer. And reading this book kind of inspired this piece. There's a quote from this book that says, and her voice trailed off, and she was looking off to the side of the road again. And I think now that this is how the running so often begins, that it is settled upon in that moment to understand the great depths of your peril. For it is not simply by slavery that you are captured, but by a kind of fraud, which paints its, its executors as guardians at the gate, Staving off African savagery when it is they themselves who are the savages, who are Mordred, who are the dragon in the Camelot's clothes. And at that moment of revelation, of understanding, running is not a thought, not even a dream, but a need no different than the need to flee a burning house. This is Hiram, Hiram Walker, and uh, he's one of the main characters in the book. And when I read that passage from this book, 
I thought about my ancestor who escaped slavery with his son, wife, and daughter. And I just could imagine what it took for him to do that and how he felt that it was, it wasn't a dream, it was a need to flee, just like fleeing from a burning house. And after reading this book, I dove into this piece. The title of the piece is called Run, Nigger, Run, and that is because there's a quote on the piece from an enslaved, formerly enslaved person. These are from slave narratives, and it's telling about um, escaping and being cautionary of the patrol, which we'll get into a little bit later. But this piece, it's, it's an homage to my ancestor, Benjamin Franklin Patterson, he was a freedom seeker. And this crest on this uh, piece was created by my father in the 80s. And the crest is to signify, uh, the lions on the crest signify the duality of our family. The one lion represents the African ancestors that we can't really trace back to. And the other lion represents our family today, the new Patterson clan. The swords on the crest represent being able to defend the family at all costs. And there is a star also that represents reaching to our highest aspirations. Along the sides of the piece, the piece is made from wood as its starting point. It's 40 by 40. I like to always have some natural textures in my piece because I think that it connects to our body and to the earth. And I wanted to connect to the ancestors and the presence in the, the spirit world and I feel like natural materials help to do that. So I started with a base of wood and the, the centerpiece is, is paper uh, superimposed with the crest that my father created in the 80s. The part that you're seeing now on the, the screen is a close-up of the inscription that is written around the piece, which is from, like I said, the slave narratives. It is from Anthony Dawson. He was enslaved in North Carolina. And the inscription says, run, nigga, run, to powder will get you. Run, nigga, run, to powder will come. Watch, nigga, watch, to powder will trick you. Watch, nigga, watch, he got a big gun. That one of the songs the slaves all know and the children down on the 20 acres used to sing. When they play in the moonlight around the cabins in the slave quarters. Sometimes I wonder if indeed white folks didn't make that song up so as niggas would keep in mind. I felt it was really important to try to bring in a narrative from a recording of someone who actually lived as an enslaved person. I have the information about my ancestor, but I don't have a recording of his, of his written uh, words, and I wanted to add to the piece something that actually um, could be tracked and was recorded. I can imagine my ancestor when he was escaping, what he must have felt like, and this idea of running away from the terror of being enslaved and not knowing where you're going to be going, not knowing what you will have in front of you, what is expected. So I wanted to really etch into the piece this idea of running. So I burned the words into the wood. I also wanted to show how the enslaved people oftentimes were only given shoes one time a year. And who knows when he was running whether his shoes were adequate enough, whether his family's shoes were adequate enough for him to go through 
the, the perils of the land that he was traversing. In my research, I found out that most of the time when people were running, they were running in winter because it was the safest time for them in terms of uh, not being caught by the dogs. And I could only imagine if you're, I mean, we live in Illinois and it's harsh winters. This was in the South, so it's not as harsh, but frigid cold. What if you don't have any shoes or adequate shoes? So I wanted to express what that must have felt like. So I painted the bottom of the soles of my feet with paint, and then I walked on the board to symbolize my ancestor walking and running away from his his uh, enslaved his owner. There's also um, this this. Um, narrative of Run, Nigger, Run became known as a, um, a music form of expression in, within the slave community. And this is a recording of the song that was, if I can get it to play, I wanted you to hear the recording of a live version of the song. In the early parts of the recordings of this song, the song was only uh, acknowledged by African Americans, by Black folks, but it was later um, taken and started to be sung in minstrel shows, and it was perverted to become um, something that it wasn't. This was for us to really express to other enslaved people when you were saying you were in danger. And this was how it was originally supposed to be sung and used within our community, but it was later perverted and used in minstrel shows. This was one of the parts of the piece that um, I think was very um, triggering for some people. I have the, the, the pieces hanging by a noose. And to me, this was a very important part of the, the project for me because lynching was used to terrorize and control black people. And I don't want us to ever forget that that was something that happened and is still happening. There's a song that Billy Holiday made famous that says, Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees, pastoral scenes of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, Scent of magnolias, sweet and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is the fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, for the trees to drop. Here is a strange and better crop. From 1882 to 1968, 4,743 lynchings occurred in the United States. This is according to records maintained by the NAACP. I remember my grandmother in the 80s being concerned about her goddaughter leaving her house to drive back to her town in 
somewhere in the south, I don't remember where she lived, because she was concerned that something would happen to her as a black woman driving at night. So it got too late, and she was told, you have to stay the night. You can't travel. So I think that it's important to still remember that this is not so long ago that these things were happening. And even today, we um, modern lynchings are, still, are taking place. Uh, in 1998, James Beard was chained to a car by three white supremacists and dragged to his death in the streets of Jasper, Texas. It wasn't until March of this year that the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act finally made lynching a hate crime. Despite the prospects of being lynched or maimed, Benjamin Franklin Patterson, who is my ancestor, took the chance to run away. So I think it's important to understand that how powerful that was for him, that desire to get away, and the fear of what could have happened. I don't know, the news symbolizes that for me. This is the story about how um, my ancestor escaped from slavery. And I'm going to give a few minutes for you to watch it. For the land of Patterson Hill, this is how the government of Patterson Hill was turned over to his first grandfather, Benjamin Patterson, in 1870, and his wife, Adam. Both of South Florida became city from and named Patterson and Senator Alabama. At some point, the soul of the way was white and dark. Yeah. Well, I'm going to start over. Is um, Larry? Lisa? Yeah. Um, turn off the mic. Don't turn off that. Okay. Oh, the mic. Sorry. Sorry. For Ramona Patterson Hurley, how we got the name Patterson. Your paternal great great grandfather, Benjamin Franklin, born in 1833, and his wife, Abigail, born in 1830, both from South Carolina, became slaves of a man named Patterson in Senator Alabama. At some point, the slaveholder needed money, and Benjamin Franklin, along with his son, Joseph Franklin, born in 1855, was sold away from his wife and daughter in the other. Born 1857, to a man named Eccles in Lowell, Alabama. Eccles was a very mean person. When one of the emancipation somehow reached him, he escaped with his son and headed back to Santa Monica and died. The way Benjamin and Match, he saw a black man plowing in the field. After hiding Joseph in some marshes, Benjamin approached the man to ask him to find Match. The man said he would get one from the house. But he stayed so long that Benjamin got suspicious and ran back to the hiding place to find Joseph. Meanwhile, Joseph had moved to another hiding place because he had seen a snake. Benjamin searched frantically for the child and feared he would have to leave him behind when he heard the approach of a barking dog at the distance. Just then, Joseph called out to his father and they managed to escape. Benjamin and Joseph were later befriended by Union soldiers with whom they stayed. Joseph said that the soldiers were nice to him and let him ride their horses. Some soldiers liked to take him up north and send him to school, but Benjamin did not want to be separated from them. Both returned to Central and joined Abigail and Ruth. 
despite the fact that it was slaveholder Patterson who sold Benjamin and Joseph away from their family, he was considered to be a good man compared to slaveholder Adam. Hence, when it became necessary to record a surname, Benjamin chose that Patterson over Beckles. The source of this information is conversations with Aunt Jody Patterson, Nova Nova, and her grandfather, John Tolly Patterson Sr., in 1978 and 1979. In tribute to the ancestors, Aunt Boyd C. Patterson, January 10, 1990. I feel I feel very privileged to have that story. I feel very privileged that my aunt was able to go and interview these ancestors before they passed away so that we could have this information before she passed away, whenever someone got married, she wrote down our entire family history, our family tree, and this handwritten, this was handwritten, what I was reading, and she gave us a, a bounded book uh, that she would present to us when we got married. So I have that lineage in this book, and this handwritten letter gives me the information of how Benjamin Franklin Patterson escaped slavery. What I want to talk about now is that the trauma that gets passed down in the bodies of African people because of slavery. There is a study Larry, we're not able to get it to move. The point is just here. Yeah. So there's a study right now that's happening, um, what well, has happened, uh, it's called epigenetics, and uh, Dr. Rachel Yehuda, she's the director of the Traumatic Stress Studies Division at the Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York, and she conducted um, a 2015 study on the children of 40 Holocaust survivors. She found that they had epigenetic changes to a gene linked to their levels of cortisol, a hormone involved in the stress response. She also found a distinctive pattern of DNA methylation, another epigenetic marker. The study concluded that both parents and unborn children were affected on genetic levels. While much of Yehuda's work has focused on the children of Holocaust survivors, she also observed that infants born to mothers who were pregnant on 9-11 had low cortisol levels, which were associated with the presence of maternal PTSD. Again, more evidence for this theory of epigenetics. And the reason why I bring that up is because of the trauma that was inflicted upon the enslaved people in America and the passing down of this the epigenetic genes that can, we know that there's high, higher blood pressure in the African-American population and it's linked to stress. There is a woman um, who has written a book called Joyce de Greer. She's written a book called, um, I'm drawing a blank for it right now, um, Slave, uh, it's, the book is about post-traumatic slave disorder. And she tells a story about how what we think in our, in our community, in our culture, is a part of being Black, is actually something that is passed down from generations. And the story goes as this. There are two mothers at a school, 
and they're talking because the boys just had a presentation. And Johnny's mother says, oh, Timmy was doing such a great job. His, his scores and his testing, he's so great. And wow, you must be so proud. And Johnny's mother says, and Timmy's mother says, yes, I'm so proud of them. But Johnny is actually the one who is succeeding. He's the one who is scoring way above everyone else. And Johnny's mother says, ah, oh, that boy, he's such a nuisance. Oh, he hits on my nerves all the time. Now the two boys are listening and watching the parents talking. And Timmy is so proud because his mother is lifting him up. But Johnny is thinking, why is my mother not proud of me? Well, can you imagine if you were a mother on a plantation and your son was picked out by the slave owner as having exceptional abilities. What would happen? What might happen? Your son can be sold away. So instead of lifting your son up, you're going to tear him down. You're going to say in front of other people, oh, no, 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 no. Johnny is, he, he's a pain in the butt. No, 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 no. He's, he's, he's a, you don't want that. And the children receive this, this traumatic experience because instead of feeling loved on, and instead of feeling lifted up, it breaks them down. But as we get older, we make jokes about, in the black community, oh yeah, that's just how black moms are. And we understand that they love us, but nevertheless, that trauma still sits in our bodies. With epigenetics, you have the, the passing down of the gene, that's just a cultural passing down, but with the story that I explained, but with epigenetics, you have the, the genes that pass down. And in my family, the reason why I bring this up is because almost every one of these people in this picture has anxiety. Several of the people in this picture have um, autoimmune disorders. We are descendants of enslaved people who had trauma, who had PTSD, and that has been passed down to us. And I think it's important that we start to understand that and recognize that and get help for that. Just to continue um, with this idea of the trauma, um, I said in my family, we have many people who are experiencing anxiety and depression. And in our communities, that is not recognized when a black woman goes to a doctor. Depression shows up differently in black women than it does in white women. In white women, they tend to be more sleepy and remove themselves from the world. But for black women, we can't. We can't remove ourselves from the world. We are usually the ones that are holding together the families. We might have multiple jobs. So when oftentimes they go to the doctor and uh, the doctor normally would look for symptoms of depression would be a withdrawn type of behavior, a sleepiness. With black women, it shows up as anger, as frustration. And doctors tend not to be able to, to recognize that. So the, 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 that continues to pass on because it's not able to be dealt with. And the children deal with the trauma of having a parent who lives with anxiety that is untreated. This is a, a, a short family uh, tree of my descendants, of my ancestors, starting at the top, Benjamin Franklin Patterson. He was a farmer. Uh, his son, who he escaped with, Joseph Franklin Patterson, was a farmer. Now, if you understand what was happening uh, just before emancipation, um, Juneteenth just happened, and we know that uh, that information of emancipation didn't get to the people in Texas till several years later. So even though just before um, 
Benjamin Franklin Patterson escaped, he had heard about emancipation. But it was so volatile a time that he couldn't just be free, he had to escape, even though there was the emancipation was on the way. So many people have asked me, well, did they escape to the north? And they didn't, they stayed in the south. And Benjamin Franklin Patterson was a farmer in the south. Joseph Franklin Patterson was a farmer in the south. And my grandfather, John T. Patterson Sr., was the first one to get uh, formal training. He was a tailor, he was a railroad postal worker, and he was a delicatessen owner. He's the first in our family to be an entrepreneur. My father, his son, was a lawyer, a business executive, and an entrepreneur. He, is the first, he had the first black brokerage firm on Wall Street. And I am an entrepreneur. I'm an artist, I'm an entrepreneur, I own my own business. And I show you this, this diagram because I want you to see how many generations it took for us to uh, lift up ourselves into being entrepreneurs, into being educated, into being um, formally educated. And I don't want to put down this idea that a farmer is not educated because um, owning your own land and producing your own food, those are, those are all wonderful qualities. And that, uh, that work ethic was passed down through our generations. Because of Benjamin Franklin Patterson, our family has this incredible grit and resilience. We are all freedom seekers. We have many entrepreneurs in our family. My father was the first millionaire in our family. We have college graduates. Uh, the first black brokerage firm on Wall Street can be accounted to our family. We have multiple artists in our family. Besides me, my uh, cousin's daughter has just completed her first uh, film. And my son, who's sitting in the back, is a singer-songwriter. And my other son is also a singer-songwriter. And my daughter is a, a dancer and an artist and a painter. We have authors in our family, published authors. My sister is a published author and my uncle, who is the husband of the aunt who is our historian and is a published author. And I say that to say that this all has been passed down from uh, Benjamin Franklin Patterson, this grit to do what you feel empowered to do and to have the strength and the resilience to keep going even in spite of being told no. I have been asked this question several times. Do you know that you are hard to manage? <laughs> are you always this way? Pushing and pushing and pushing for what you want. On these occasions, I'm taken aback by the idea that my strength and determination is offensive. That somehow I need to stop pushing for what I want or learn how to be managed. This is the antithesis of what drove Benjamin Franklin Patterson to take back his freedom. It is in my nature to be strong, to be inquisitive, to challenge the system, to make sure my history, my story, and voice are heard. In this season of my life, my voice is resounding through my art. This resounding voice led me to be censored. Hello, everybody. My name is Mario. I'm going to talk about my art. Um, art is about the trigger. 
My trip is on an overall meaning of the peace and finals that means for myself as for how it's handled by the news that's subtitled. This thing go big and bad news that you can put someone's head through. It's a metal, 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 let's see if I can ask the word, metal, 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 Metaphysical as a statement to the history of your expression. Yeah, no. And of course, I get triggered by it because people in my family got lodged back in the 1800s. But that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking at who the artist is. Even if it, this work by a white artist, there are things about it that I would like because I'm going to read it until what's in my mind. In my heart, my visual experience. It's a great piece. In my opinion, I like the way it's hung. Rug nigger. Well, rug not. Rug nigger. It's not saying rug nigger. It's the context. It's historical context. What's it? Run in word. Run in. I mean, the word was used. People said it because still say it. It's like, I mean, it's like I mean one and I don't use a word myself. Hmm. But plus it was something I knew that I wasn't. And you know the whole thing about sticks and stones will break my bones. But the thing about it is people that use it, it's the context in which they use it. Hello. Uh, I'm Alex. I'm a, a black person, and I think the art is definitely healing. And a part of healing is addressing the past, and it's entirely up to the people now to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, so much of what has been taken from how we navigate uh, understanding the past, whether it's through a mission or being destroyed or not being seen as important enough or neglected. Many of these stories and our truths have the power to unlock so much about how we feel and understand each other and how we move towards the future. And it really is up to the artists and cultural creators to be the ones to navigate those conversations, particularly as it pertains to their own lineage. It is that much more important. And I think across this nation and across the globe, we are finding that Black artists want to get that much more personal to dig deep beyond themselves, doing the cultural work, looking at their lineages and trying to find ways of breaking the curses that are generational that none of us even asked for, or figuring out how we navigate the times we are in with a sense of community with other folks. I think the biggest thing is that institutions, galleries, allies, anyone that wants to be supportive of this work uh, can do is to simply make way for it. And to understand that this work exists in the space of being. For some people, it's not palatable, but it's the conditions that people lived in in those times that were not palatable. So this artwork, uh, reflecting that, should not be seen as easily digestible. I think it's what makes this piece beautiful in such a twisted way. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's about the materials and not about the depiction of a body or something that is so graphic it's going to be etched into your brain for the next week of your life or something. I don't think in that context a trigger warning is needed. I think that in this context, we get to lead with a sense of pride and beauty and you get the chance to see that all these many people can follow. They follow uh, their descendants from this person that this piece is about. My name is Chad Minor. I identify as a white male. My personal private reaction is deep as I run through my head because I've been censored within myself. Why are artists not allowed to be activists? What are these art organizations trying to do by separating identity from the artist? Should artists not rock the moon? I think being censored is an honor. It's usually all about the organization because they are close right. Art that has an immense power to educate and come up against minds that are removing more from the reality of daily life. 
I was thinking about the Statue of Liberty, funded by the abolitionists in France, that the original statue had chains that they censored. That became a symbol of the country. The country is obsessed with taking edgy ideas and removing the problematic component and making it more dismal or family. Subtle manipulation of history. The first thing that comes to my mind is fear, the climate of fear. It's a tacit approval of the low common denominator. It's interesting to me. I feel that to me, censorship is pernicious because it works on many levels. It's economic, it's paid for play. In lots of respects, if you can't engage with them, then you are in effect seeing a lack of public space and a lack of discourse not controlled by public spaces. You're thinking about giving a voice to the voices. Art should not be sanctioned. I'm always interested in artists who break the law. To me, showing their work, even if I do not like the work, but in general, I have to find art as being free from ethical concerns. There is always going to be an anti-Semitic that is my artist. An artistic resonance that employed social and cultural space on some level. Artists create work to create this response. The art was successful. Somebody did not want to deal with the subject that is incredibly relevant. Lynching laws just got established. Is it the institution's job to the game plan that is too great? Who has the right to appropriate the memorialization of history publicly? These are always contested issues. So many of you know that uh, I was supposed to have some art in this show, but because of the N word and the news, it was not deemed appropriate for the show. For me, that felt like a stab because this is a BIPOC show. It's a Black, Indigenous, People of Color show. And I went on a discovery to find out what other people thought of art being censored. What you just heard were interviews that I did a few days after being censored. I was actually going to my cousin's friend's jazz show and I went to the wrong location. Again, it's always like these angels come up in my life, you know. I went to the long, wrong location and it's actually, it was actually the Stony Island Arts Bank, which is the most incredible space ever. And that's in the, on the, in the South Side, in the Black community, and it's an art gallery space for Black people. And I went inside and I interviewed people there and I showed them my work. I didn't say that I was an artist. Um, I asked them their feelings about the art and whether they felt that it was triggering to them, whether they felt it should be seen and should it be seen in white spaces or black spaces. And two of the uh, pieces that were read were from those interviews and the third one was from an interview with Jen, who just spoke at the end. After I left um, those interviews, I was driving past and I saw this image on uh, the wall in the West Loop. And it just lifted me up so much because I was like, hallelujah. Right in the middle of Chicago, there is this black power fist. And it just gave me inspiration to keep moving on, to keep telling my story. And this idea of uh, censorship, censor means to suppress inappropriate parts of something. Um, being censored reminded me of what black people often experience in white spaces, that we are too much, too loud, too aggressive, too raw, too real, that we have to tone down our vibe, our pain, our truth. I went through many stages because I was triggered by the experience, grief, anger, sadness, frustration, concern. 
about my artistry, about my voice as an artist, concern for my societal peace living in Evanston, and concern for the connections to people that are connected in unison to this art center, to Lisa, to Fran, the curator. And as a Black woman who's experienced many levels of racism, racial gaslighting, closeted racism, I find community and people who share a desire to talk about the raw experiences that Black people face. They want to see and hear these experiences uncensored. In my community, this is considered cathartic, activating towards racial healing. Despite the confrontation, it was important to have reconciliation. And I don't know that we will ever get to the bottom of the differences that we had. And my opinion of being censored may not be the opinion of the curator, may not be the opinion of the art gallery, it may not be the opinion of the sponsor. But for me, it felt like being censored. And after I went through those, those feelings of being censored and, and the interviews that I did with, with other people, I wanted to find a way to reconcile and to still be in community with the gallery, be in community with the sponsor, Edmonton May, be in community with the curator, Fran. And we went through a process of emailing and writing back and forth and trying to find a way to come together in community. Reconciliation is a process that allows for acknowledgement, it allows for mourning, public mourning, it allows for forgiveness, it allows for healing. It, it can be an ongoing conversation about what exactly happened in terms of censorship. What is important is the extending of the olive branch, which is why I'm here, because there was an olive branch that was extended. We want to move the conversation forward. It may not be tied up me in a bow. It might be me or someone like me that is hard to manage or pushing the boundary. In this world, there is a place for the soft hand and the boundary pushers. I would like to just say that I'm so grateful for all of you all coming to listen to my story about my ancestor and about my art process and about the ways that I went on to present this, including today with all of the technical difficulties. And Lisa said to me this morning after we hung the piece, you're gonna go home and change, right? But guess what, Lisa? I had these clothes in my car. <laughs> because I never got to go home. <laughs> there were so many technical difficulties and um, I ended up staying here. So it was good that I brought the clothes. Um, I want to just talk to you a little bit about um, what's coming next for me. I mean, I talked a little bit about the reconciliation process, but what's coming next for me is these are the works that I have in progress. Uh, I started the top project called the Nigger Project in 2019 and was slated to have it displayed at Ice House Gallery, but the pandemic came and um, she closed the gallery. This project came about because my son was talking on the phone to one of his white friends, and I could hear through the phone that his white friend was using the N-word. And I said to my son, that doesn't bother you? It doesn't bother you that a white person is using that word? And at the time, he said, no, it doesn't bother me. It just, just means my friend, dude. And I was shocked. I thought my grandmother, my civil rights grandmother is rolling over in the grave right now. And so I went on a quest to understand this generation, three generations post-civil rights, and their understanding of the N-word. So I did multiple interviews, a longer version of what I did for this, this um, talk. 
And um, it's still in process because of the, the pandemic and not um, having a place to show it. I also recently was on a artist residency in Mexico and I came back with some really good research on Afro-Mexicans. And as I said in the beginning, my art is dedicated to Africans in the diaspora. And so I'm working on that, um, those, those, that process as well. And this next one is dedicated to my mother's lineage, the Blackwells, and it's called Who's at the Table? And it will be visiting my mother's uh, family is more matrilineal than my, my father's. And I'll be really getting you guys to know about my mother's family and that history. And the last one is, is an ongoing exhibit that Lisa actually knows about. It's actually hanging from the window of my apartment and I started it in the beginning of the pandemic. It's called The Fabric of Our Lives. And it is morphing as the pandemic is morphing. And it started off with images and the, the, the elements and the wind have destroyed it. And I'm, it's not going anywhere until the pandemic is over. So at that time, you will see, I've been recording pictures every year of what, what the fabric looks like. And I will um, have a, a, a final summary once it's done. So those are the works that I've got in progress. And I'm so grateful again that everybody came out. I would like to open up the converse, the floor for questions about the piece or questions about my artistry, if you have any. I'm going to notify the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. No questions? Yes. What is uh, the main project for the out? Well, maybe Lisa will let me show them in her gallery. <laughs> and then I can have a deadline. <laughs> And I think that's from the deadline. <laughs> right, because the, um, the gallery closed down, and that's where this, was would all of it show there, or just which part? Just the, the top one was the one that was supposed to be shown in um, Ice House Gallery. Yeah. Any other questions? Who is this? What made you? Well, I have a really um, strong desire to help people understand the effects of uh, child slavery throughout the diaspora. Living in the United States, we focus only on what happened here and how it affected us. But Brazil is actually the largest location of African enslaved, the descendants of African enslaved people in the diaspora. Uh, I believe it's almost as large as Africa in terms of how the, the, the ratio of people. And in Mexico, they're only 1% of the population, but they're a hidden population. They're not, it's not talked about in history books uh, in Mexico. And they are really marginalized. And I wanted to find out about that group, that community, and I wanted to tell their story as it relates to our story as well. Yeah. Did you do the bear cruise? I did, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, you talk a little bit about what the process has been as it relates to getting your immediate family engaged with you. Can you, can you, okay. so can you talk, talk about what the process has been as it relates to you getting your immediate family engaged with you in terms of working on the project? Yeah, so the, 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 the photos, um, my family was very much involved in terms of digging deep. My, a lot of the black and white photos of my grandfather I got from my, one of my older sisters. And um, the, the crest you 
know, the entire, we all have a copy of that press. And I have just been using it in my artistry, but um, as I said, my cousin, whose daughter is a filmmaker and a screenwriter, she's using the name in her latest um, film uh, pilot that she made, and she calls the university Patterson University. So we're all extremely proud of our heritage, of our lineage of the Patterson line, despite the fact that that's not our real name. You know, we, we took that name, our descendant, Benjamin Franklin Patterson took that name because Patterson was the good slave um, owner and the one that he had been sold to was not. And we didn't have another name, but we, it is the new Patterson name. It's the new Patterson plan. We didn't have any of that kind of, um, my, in my family, they're mostly writers and artists. So we didn't really have any quilt making in terms of like passing down that as a, as a thing, as a thing, but we, um, the writing gets passed down. My, my, my uncle is a published writer and now my, my cousin's daughter is writing screenplays, you know, um, my dog, my sister is a published author twice over, you know, so we have more of that in our lineage, this idea of um, education and writing and um, artistry and entrepreneurship. Yeah. Any online questions? No, just comments. Wonderful presentation. Oh, I'm loving what you're doing and then they're all talking to each other. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you talk about uh, the fabric of our lives? Yeah. So I felt like um, the pandemic, like fabric is you know, these pieces that are woven together and held tightly. And I felt like during the pandemic, it was like we were, you know, falling apart. And so I wanted to, um, I actually used my, um, my boyfriend and I, as an example, you know, our love during the pandemic, you know, how we were trying to stay together, living, we lived separately, but with the pandemic, we stayed in separate houses because in the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was so scared. If you're not in your pandemic bubble, you can't, you know, talk to each other. And he really was trying to make a concerted effort of how to bring the fabric together, how to, how to you know, keep us close. And one time he said, we're going to have an outdoor date. And he brought one of those, um, those, those games that you throw the, the stacks in. And he brought like triple masks <laughs> and gloves. This is what we thought he had to wear gloves on everything. And we had a, an outdoor date. And it just inspired me that, you know, how our lives are woven together like fabric. And how do we keep that? close together, but that because of the pandemic, there's a, 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 a wearing down of that fabric and people are starting to feel weary about what's happening to our lives because of something that we can't control. So I wanted to see how long it would take for without me doing anything, the fabric to transform to really show that you can't, you can't preserve fabric unless you do something to preserve it. And to be in love, to be a family member, to be a friend, you have to actively do something to preserve that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Also, I have a book here at the front. If you'd like to write down any of your thoughts about the presentation or the piece, please come and look at it closely. There's a QR code on the piece that is meant for when it is hung in um, an installation. That people can scan the QR code. And uh, if it were in a gallery, there would be headphones 
next to it on a podium so that the person could be standing and watching the piece and listening to the story at the same time. So please take time to write any comments you might have. Thank you so much for coming.